We had to protect human health and we had to protect the environment. That's the goal of the remediation project. How do you do that? It's a challenge. This property has been the lifeblood of this family for a hundred years. And you don't give that away. Everything that's here started from my dad's decision to go into the ship dismantling business. From ship dismantling, we ended up in the steel pipe fitting business, which we're still in. We ended up in barge building, which we have exited. Environmental remediation is a business we do not know. At Zydell, it was mostly a chemical called PCBs. They're persistent chemicals. Once they're in the environment, they don't break down. We were in a no-fail mission. It was 24 hours a day. I look back and I think, God dang it, that was a lot of work. This was a tough project. It was complex. There were so many different ways that we could have been sunk. The transformation is just incredible. What people don't see out of Zydell is the historic site that remains out there. It's still buried below our remedy. The cap was something that hadn't been done before to this magnitude in this river. The easiest thing would have been for us to sell this property and you take the money to the bank and everybody's happy. But that would not have carried out our vision. When I think about the Zydell Way, the first thing that comes to mind is simply doing what we say we're going to do. Each one of those ships had a variety of hazardous substances that were incorporated into the structural components of the ship. A lot of the material didn't have salvage value. This material was oftentimes disposed back onto the land. That was just the standard industrial practice at the time. When an awareness began to develop around the potential hazards associated with this, Zydell's adapted to that. But there was this legacy of environmental contamination. We started in 1994 having received a letter from the Oregon DEQ inviting us to join the voluntary cleanup program. And they made it very clear in the letter that it was entirely our choice. But if we elected not to, we may be forced, uh, facing an enforcement action. So that sort of helped us a little bit to decide to join the voluntary cleanup program. If the fit is a good one and the owner shows good faith to move forward and address the contaminants at their property, then we'll entertain a voluntary agreement and move forward in that direction. And it's a better opportunity for everybody. And it was the right thing to do. We contributed to a substantial amount of the contaminants on the site, and it was our obligation to deal with it. So we got in and did what we needed to do. They looked at it as if we're going to do this, we're going to do this right. So they realized that this was not going to be a simple process. They realized that it was not going to be an inexpensive process. We knew that at some point in time, we wanted to deal with the redevelopment of the site. And before that could be done, we knew we would have to answer the remediation question. The Zydell property was a heavy industrial piece of property that we all knew was going to be redeveloped. What we did, and it was a paradigm shift, I think, for the people that I was working with and regulatory agencies, the development of this property, the redevelopment, reuse of this property was going to be the remedy. And so that's where we began with the end in mind. We looked at what is the property going to be used for, and then we incorporated that redevelopment into the remedial action, which is a lot more cost-effective and efficient way to do it.
the simple goal statement of the project, as determined by the Oregon DEQ, is to protect human health and the environment. So what does that mean to protect the environment? That means we have a number of ecological goals. To protect water quality for fish and wildlife and humans who are using the river, to protect human health for people who are using the land, and to actually protect the health of wildlife that will be using the new habitat. The design team had a whole suite of challenges in designing this remediation. The project itself extends 3,000 feet along the river, more than half a mile. That's a very big linear project. And the design is different as we go downstream through the project. So we had a team of engineers of different disciplines figuring all that out through design. I look at specifically the chemicals that were in the environment related to historical operations. I understand the toxicity associated with those chemicals and then evaluate how people or fish or other animals might come into contact with those chemicals. We collect samples in the sediment, in the water, in the soil, and look at the concentrations over an area. And then we use that information in combination with our understanding of how people would be exposed. And that's how we decide what needs to be cleaned up. There's always a wide variety of contaminants. We kind of have the usual suspects out at the Zydell site. But the majority of the contamination out at Zydell, you can't see. There are the PCBs. We send these things into the lab and they come back and they say, oh, this is really screaming with PCBs and you look at it and it looks like a normal piece of dirt. PCBs are everywhere in the environment. They're found throughout the Willamette River. Anywhere you look, you'll find PCBs because they're used historically in so many products. PCBs are a fire retardant. When a shell would hit the ship, they put PCBs in the paint so that the paint wouldn't catch on fire and the whole boat wouldn't burn up because of one shell hitting it. And they're persistent chemicals. Once they're in the environment, they don't break down. So even if we clean up every PCB that was the result of historical Zydell operations, there would still be PCBs throughout the Willamette River. So it was really about identifying the optimal remedy, the location of that remedy, while understanding that we would never get to zero. It's just not possible. Our challenge, again, was to put that into an appropriate context and relate that context to, OK, what are we going to do about it, and what can we do about it? The Risk assessors and the environmental scientists frame the issue. So where is it? What is it? Where is it going? Where could it go? And then the engineers are looking at the physical ways in which we can either remove it or immobilize it or isolate it. The difference between a cleanup and a remediation is a cleanup removes the contamination. Remediation occurs in a situation when it may not be practical to go in and remove all of the contamination. You are looking at leaving some of the contamination in place. The Zydell project is a containment remedy to remove all the contamination that would have prevented risk to human health in the environment would have cost 10, 20 times more money which would have been unaffordable. And so the decision was to contain the contaminants on site. A remediation would be to, let's say we come in and we put down a cap or a barrier to humans or animals coming in and contacting that contamination. We're managing the risk, we're breaking the exposure pathway, but we're doing it in a different way where we're using engineering controls or other types of controls to prevent that risk from occurring. When the environmental regulations were first promulgated, there was a tendency to be very prescriptive Zydell was actually a lot different. It was conducted under state regulations, which were provided greater flexibility than some of the federal regulations did. It was under much of the same construct as the federal Superfund regulations, but 
I think it took into account sometimes that those didn't work well, especially when you had a responsible party that was interested in cleaning up the property, and especially when the property was going to be used for a purpose other than what it was originally used for. When I came in to um, be the project manager, Moles Foster and Alonji had already been working on the project for a number of years, and they had done the risk assessment and the feasibility study and a remedial investigation and had uh, taken it through the record of decision with Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and a court order was issued by the Oregon court, a consent judgment. A consent judgment is a contract with the state of Oregon, in this case the Department of Environmental Quality and the property owner. What it does is sets the obligations of both parties very specifically. We had a huge uh, team of, of consultants, engineers, and, and others. We had a whole permitting process at various levels of government. I think the most challenging part of the remediation project was dealing with the permitting that we had to do both locally and especially through the federal government. It was a sequence of permits, and um, there were some big permits that took years to work towards and some smaller steps along the way. We had very capable assistance from our project management team to find our way through that. This is a very visible uh, piece of property, a very visible project. There's a lot of opportunity, so there's a lot of interest. There had been a design taken to a point with enough information in it for the state agency to reach their record of decision. But there were a lot of unknowns. It was left unclear where the boundary of the in-water sediment cap would be. And it was up to Zydell's team and the DEQ to figure out where that final line was going to be. We were looking at the spatial distribution of these PCBs, and there was a lot of variety in concentrations offshore of Zydell. We ran a variety of scenarios where we changed the boundaries, and we found there was a point of diminishing returns. There was a clear elbow in the curve where you could do more remedy, but not get much more in terms of limiting risk. Once we understood where the sediment cap would be implemented, then we needed to make sure that the chemicals below the cap wouldn't express through the cap and continue to be a source of exposure to human health in the environment. A sediment cap is essentially a sand-based sponge for contaminants. So you put a sediment cap in and the sand works to capture chemicals that could be coming up through the contaminated sediment into the river. What you have is the organic carbon within the sand gives chemicals a site to occupy. And so once they sorb into that organic material, they don't tend to leave. They're very what's called uh, hydrophobic. So once they find a good place to live, they don't want to be in the water anymore. What the model shows you is over time how saturated this cap is getting with chemicals. And at some point, you have captured everything. There's nothing else to worry about. We don't have x-ray vision. We can't see underground. And we're trying to cure something that's underground. And we don't know what we're going to find. We don't know what we're going to find in the water. And we don't know what we're going to find up land. We started with the removal of hotspots in the upland. And that was really our opportunity to demonstrate to DEQ that we could effectively remove contaminated soils that contained metals and PCBs, but also contained asbestos, you know, all of them together, and how to do it safely. And that's gonna get all of our hotspot, even though we might have some undulations inside of that, we know that the lowest point captures that entire mass of highly contaminated materials. So we can remove that and we can bring it off to the landfill and dispose of that material. We were able to excavate the hot spots and then backfill those with clean dirt. The upland cap is designed to prevent direct contact with contamination. 
We apply this remediation, basically isolating low-level contamination that still remains out there because of the historic practices and that legacy, it's still buried out there. There are a lot of bits and pieces of ships and buildings that have been demolished around town, and they're all out there and they're still living below our soil cap. I'm standing on the upland cap on the Zydell remediation project, and you actually don't see anything here except gravel, because the gravel is the cap. So people can be on this cap, like I am right now, and I'm fine. There's no contamination here. There's a barrier between me and the contamination, and that's the cap. At the base of this gravel, there's some orange geotextile fabric. The orange fabric means that if you're digging a hole out here and you see orange fabric, you stop digging and you figure out why there's orange fabric there. You go to the site management plan, which is a document that tells you exactly what used to be here, what's still here below that orange fabric, and if you need to get below that fabric, what you have to do. That site management plan just sets forth what are the procedures? What, what kind of health and safety needs to go in place to protect the workers who are digging those basements and foundations? How do we manage the soils that are being dug that can't go back in place? Can we move it around the site or does it have to go off to the landfill? It gives us a checklist of things to do and make sure that they're addressed. Things went very well. So we had a lot of confidence then going into the next season that we knew how to manage soils properly and could do the bank grading, the hotspot bank grading, and the sediment cap placement, where they would be a much more time critical element. There's another challenge that we have working on this river, and that is the presence of salmon and steelhead that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. Because those fish are in the river, the state and federal agencies have designated a window of time when doing work in the river has the least impact on those fish. And that's July 1st, and it closes October 31st. We get four months to be in the river. We had started that season in 2011 by preparing some of the upper breaches of the bank. We were waiting for a permit to come for working below that line, which is about mid-bank. July 1st, which was the first day of the in-water work window, we have on site four large crane derricks, three dive crews, multiple materials barges, all ready to get to action on day one. That was all sitting here for the last couple of weeks of June, waiting for 7 a.m. July 1st. This permit, if it was late at all, we're starting to look at tens of thousand dollars per day to stand by. And this was a real rodeo, I have to tell you. A lot of energy and a lot of tension uh, wound up uh, behind this permit, but it came in, Paul got it there. I got the permit signed at 11.45 a.m. June 30th. <laughs> and of course, everybody's biting their nails. You know, are we getting it, are we getting it? And on uh, July 1st, that in-water work started. Then it came time to build. Here comes the first piece of the Zydell remediation project. <laughs> We had to remove all the old dock pilings and the big huge timbers that were bolted to the tops of those before we could do any of the other work we had to do. There were 2,200 pilings. We've got divers with underwater hydraulic chainsaws and they're cutting them off at the mud line. Cranes pulling these things out. And in 17 days, they had removed 2,200 wood pilings and all the associated structure that went with it. We went out and cleared all the vegetation off the bank and we suddenly see this historic artifacts surfacing. We started with something that was very, very degraded. Lots of industrial debris, lots of stuff in the water, in the mud, on the riverbank, just uh, decades and decades of industrial and urban debris that accumulated. And we had to clean all of that up, create a new clean cap riverbank and sediment cap, but then make sure that we put a habitat layer on top of that. 
number one, you have to have a good team, and you have to have a good design, and you have to manage risk, and you have to manage change. And this project contained lots of change and, and lots of risk. total of five floating rigs, eight barges, three tugboats, a half a dozen bulldozers, another half a dozen excavators, compactors, 50, 60 men at times. It was 24 hours a day. What you can see out there right now is just kind of this nice beach, but there's a lot going on underneath it. We start off with what's actually doing the bulk of the work, which is a two foot thick, clean sand layer and it's applied over contaminated sediment very carefully. What happens with the sediment is that there's a groundwater discharge. It can carry with it the sediment contamination upward and into this clean sediment cap. Our bare minimum for a sand cap placement was two feet of sand. It couldn't be 1.99 feet of sand. It couldn't be one and a half feet of sand. It had to be two feet. If we had to check every day and make sure the placement method was working, otherwise we would have to go back and place more sand in an area. And then on top of that is an erosion layer, an armoring layer. We've got about two feet of rock armor, which is a wide gradation of rock that acts together that prevents the scour of that clean sand cap that's underneath it. The armor, it protects whatever we put down underneath it. And that armor is built to a specification of size and weight. And based on that size and weight, it will deal with conditions in the river. If we had great big waves, we'd use great big armor. I'm a very critical piece, and one element that you know, the civil engineers and environmental engineers really have to focus on is making sure that all your hard work doesn't just wash away. And then the last element, which is you know, ultimately the most visible element, is the habitat gravel that's laid across the top. I actually see it as another layer of armor on the engineering side of things. It really complemented the design that we were putting together and provided this higher habitat function as well. We had to modify our design a number of times and there was a challenge making sure the rock was going to be stable and armor the bank and hold all the material in at the same time being fish friendly. In a sense we're repairing damage that has been done but we're doing it in a way that adds benefit. If you're talking about people, a beneficial use could be having clean water to swim in. For a salmon, it's that they don't swim into the area and instantly die because it's poison. For the osprey, it can find that salmon and have a nice dinner. We look at how can we maximize the beneficial uses of a site for all of those users. Not that I knew what the right answer was, but I wanted to make sure that the design we got to had the highest ecological value and benefit that we could put into it. Our design team constantly looked at how can we make our project as sustainable as possible. We found a lot of different ways to do that. Behind me is the beautiful and iconic Tilikum Crossing Bridge of the People that was built by TriMet, which is our regional transportation agency, as a mass transit, pedestrian, and bicycle only bridge. No cars, no trucks. It's really actually quite unique. The bridge happens to go right through the middle of the Zydell remediation project. We were in our final year of design and someone says, hey, we're building this bridge across the river, across your site. And it was this initially just kind of this shock moment of, well, what do you mean? Someone was going to build a bridge right through the middle of our remediation project at the very same time. <laughs> that we were doing our remediation project. And we kind of all went, uh, what? <laughs> well, 
This started a uh, very, very good collaboration between the Zydell <coughs> design team and the TriMet bridge design team. Over here on the approach to the bridge, it has concrete walls on both sides, and then it's filled with dirt and rock, and then there's concrete on top, and then the tracks and the sidewalks and all that. We realized that there was an opportunity here. Inside <coughs> this wall behind me is the containment cell that the Zydell Remediation Project built. We took some of our lower level contaminated soil that we were excavating. Instead of putting that in dump trucks and shipping it out to the landfill, why don't we bury it inside what's going to be your approach to the bridge? And that saves us from loading it in trucks, sending those trucks on the public streets and highways out to Eastern Oregon to a landfill, and all the associated emissions from those diesel engines. And it saves you, TriMet, from bringing an equal number of trucks in with clean fill. It's a win-win. We came to that agreement. That's what we did. It's entombed under the approach to the Tillicum Bridge. In the slipway, which is this ramped area where the barge is launched, the design team had to do something very different because we couldn't put in the standard sediment cap that we did in the rest of the project. The slipway was an interesting challenge in and of itself. You know, I've described the sediment cap before. We've got two feet of clean sand and we've got two feet of rock armor and six inches of habitat gravel on top of that. So here's four and a half feet of material. And the slipway, which they needed to continue to use has a 16 inch tall rail. And so if we put in four and a half feet material on top of that, we've buried the rail. So to let the corporation continue to launch barges here, the engineering team came up with an innovative solution, which is a material that's called a reactive core mat. We essentially compress two feet of sand into a centimeter thick layer. It's basically two different synthetic materials that are actually quilted together. It's two fabrics with activated carbon plus this mineral apatite. The combination of those two materials attract and bind up the contaminants that we have on this site. We're just kind of locked in there for centuries. Then we, what's called hydroseeding, where a truck with a slurry of fertilizer and seed mix and some fibrous material that sticks things together, they sprayed that on top of all the topsoil. And then on top of that, we brought in big rolls of coir mesh fabric. And it's the fibers that are on the outside of a coconut. It's a very tough fiber, but it will biodegrade over time. And that was part of our erosion control until the plants grew. Now what the soil cap does, and what we call bioengineering or soil bioengineering, we're relying on the plants to be the armor and the framework that holds everything together. So below ground, as the plants grow, they're sending out roots and we've designed a plant pallet that has plants that send roots laterally downward and all of these roots and then the grasses and everything are intertwined and, and create this skeleton that holds the soil together. We brought in initially just under 16,000 native shrubs, and then just under 300 trees. The result is an incredible riverbank. I think it's the best riverbank in the city of Portland. And it's got all kinds of native shrubs and trees and grasses and flowering plants. And it just keeps getting better year after year after year, getting denser and taller and lots and lots of habitat in here for fish and wildlife. So we're all pretty proud of it. It was a tremendous effort to do it this way.
And so here's this brand new shoreline that, again, most people might look right past or see the landscape quality of it, but it is the remedy itself and it's the most visible part. And it's connected to that gravel beach and the sediment cap that's out in the river that again was part of the major undertaking here. That's 16 acres of bank line, modification, sand placement, armoring, confirmation that the remedy was constructed as we planned. All of that work needed to be done in four months and it was done within four months. There are so many cleanups that are stuck in that iterative phase. Our highly technical and transparent process really allowed us to provide Oregon DEQ with the information and the support they needed to feel comfortable with the remedy and approve it and move it forward. A very collaborative approach. It's necessary in order to move these projects forward. It was a great effort, um, really on all, on all sides. This project is a real benchmark for remediation in terms of implementing a successful remedy in the Willamette River and showing that it could be done. And it was implemented by a, a private sector entity voluntarily.